the forces that drive plate tectonics is has has been the topic of conversation ever since plate tectonics was proposed, and maybe even before that, actually, and thought what was causing the geological deformation at the surface. And this is a picture from Forsyth and Uyghur in 1975. This, you'll see this, this uh, picture in many textbooks. Um, and it lists most of the plate driving forces that are commonly considered. And I'll talk about some of them today. But I'll point out a few here. The um, uh, let's see, DF is the drag force. You'll notice that it goes both ways. So it depends on if the plates are moving faster than the mantle, then it would resist the, um, the motion of the plate. Or if the mantle is going faster than the plates, then it pushes the plate. Okay, so you can have a drag force, and you can have that maybe different over the continents. The slab pull force is, um, is pulling down. And yeah. And then there's there's several other forces that um, uh, we'll cross some of them as we go. Uh, force in the Anueta concluded that the slabs were very important for driving the plates. And um, uh, basically, what they uh, looked at was the you see the pattern of plate motions at the surface. And I'll show you several of these. The um, what forces, if you can estimate the geometry of these different forces, what um, what combination of the different forces produce the observed geometry and plate motions on the surface of the Earth today? And so what I'm showing here is um, plate motions in terms of relative to the average uh, plate motion, uh, average plate speed. Okay, so if you had a value of in the reds, they're going two times faster than average. You have it in the blues and greens, they're maybe going about half, half as fast as average. So the world is really divided into two groups. There's the Pacific side of the world with plate motions going about twice as fast as average. And the Atlantic side of the world with plate motions going about half as fast as average. So actually the ratio of those two, we talk about the um, Speed of this place that has subduction zones, Nazca, Pacific, Indian, Australian, uh, those are going about three and a half times faster than the place that don't have subduction zones. So that right there tells you that um, slabs are very important for, uh, for driving plate motions. Okay, so what is the current current understanding of the plate motion, uh, plate driving forces? This problem's been around for 50 years. What is the, uh, the current understanding? So. Um, you can look in a lot of papers and a lot of textbooks, and they'll tell you a lot of different things. So I, um, I went to the, the source of all the, the best <laughs> summary that you can think of. And um, so if you look on Wikipedia, current scientific opinion is that slap pull is thought to be the greatest force acting on plates, and I was happy to see my paper about that cited. However, North American plate is nowhere being subducted yet. Is in motion and that presents a problem. So it seems to me that um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what drives the plates, and this is a fundamental problem in the earth sciences. And actually, um, it's fairly well understood that the ultimate source, the ultimate energy source for driving plate motions is convection in the earth's mantle. So the mantle is losing heat. Backs and plate motions are the surface expression. So, and this uh, this idea has been around for some time. Holmes, 1931, is one of the first to propose it, and he even had diagrams that look somewhat similar to spreading and things like that. So, ultimately, the plates are the surface expression of convection. But then, how specifically are they linked to the how how specifically are they linked to the convection the, the convective process? And that's what I'm going to try and get out today. So, um, in the last 10, maybe more years, we've been able to develop uh, global mantle circulation models. These two models use estimates of the density structure from the mantle to drive mantle flow. And they assume a viscosity structure from the mantle in order to, to produce, the, produce the mantle. So here's some cross-sections from A to B across South America. Here's the mass of a slab that's sinking and driving flow circulation between the Pacific and South America. 
There's a cross section across Africa, and this is that big uh, low velocity zone that Rob talked about uh, rising beneath them. You can argue about uh, some of the details of how you convert these seismic tomography images to density and about the viscosity structure, and that's where a lot of the complexity lies. But in general, you need to ask how are the plates coupled to this large scale mantle flow? We think that the slabs are important, so how are the slabs connected to the plates? And those questions are fundamental to understanding the, um, the plate, uh, how, how plates, plate motions are coupled to the mantle flow in the interior. So basically, both of these questions have how coupling the slabs to the subducting plates, coupling a flow to the surface plates, they both depend to a large extent on the rheology that you assume. How strong are the slabs? Can they transmit that entire slab full force? How, how, if there's a low viscosity of sphere beneath the plates, how does that couple mantle flow to the plates and does it change with different parts of the earth or earth or ridges different than the Okay, so we can estimate the driving forces. So here I've estimated from the Lalaman with all data set. Uh, the slab pull force, and basically that's just, you can estimate how big the slab is in the upper mantle and what is the excess mass of that, so if you apply gravity into that, that gives you a force, and that is up to about 5 times 10 to 13 newtons per meter, could be up And then, for basal tractions, basically I took a mantle flow model that I've developed, and it's constrained by seismic and some of this, and I estimated Attractions that that model applies to the base of the plates. Okay, and those in or are in the order of say two megapascals applied to the base of the plates. Okay, now we can ask: Well, is the slab pull force able to transmit? Can you transmit that mass, that entire slab pull force, from the descending slab to the surface plate? So this. So if we have the maximum pull from the slabs of 5 times 10 to 13, we'll be generous and say it's distributed over 100 kilometer thick plate, then you have a maximum of an average pull stress of 500 megapascals. This is very large. And in fact, um, this is an estimate of uh, the maximum differential stress that rocks can withstand. This is from Pulse 7 on 1995, and kind of the maximum is in that 500 megapascals. So some people might say, well, that's governing how much pulse stress there could be. But remember, this is there's seismicity in here and a lot of other processes that can weaken the plate, and especially in this in the subduction zone. And so you could argue, well, maybe you can only support some fraction of that pulse force. Okay. Let's do another let's look at the basal traction. So here we have one. These are the basal tractions I showed you before. The colors represent the um, magnitude of the traction magnitude. So this is what I showed you before. You can see the patterns of color. And, but if you add deep cratons, deep stiff cratons to the base of the plates where we see them, like in South America, um, Asia, and so forth, and they protrude down deeper, you see that the traction magnitude, from here to South America, here to here, the traction magnitude is increased. And that's because those plates are now more uh, coupled to the mantle, mantle flow. And you take the ratio of using a layered, this layered plates, just a simple layer of the plates, or um, a lithosphere that has some mechanical depth to it, then this is the ratio. Again, you can see the cratons standing out there about three times, three to five times. The tractions beneath them would be three to five times more, just from having those, uh, those deep plates. So that's something that we need to consider also. So now let's. Um, Look at all these forces, we'll balance the forces on all the plates, and then see if we can predict the plate. Okay, so to do this, we're going to do a torque balance for each plate, and net torque on each plate has to be zero. So we're going to first consider the driving forces. So if we have some the mantle flow that's going to push on the base of the plates, we can add up all those torques for each plate. Okay? And we can add the um, the slab pull force to them. For the resisting torques, we'll do an experiment where we take our mantle with the viscosity model that we choose and we push each plate in each different direction. 
and we'll see the mantle's response in terms of the resistance that the mantle uh, gives to that, that type of motion. And so we can tally those all up in terms of the resisting forces to each unit motion of a plane. And so we can set the driving, the driving force equal to the resisting force, and it's simply invert that end matrix, and you get predicted plate motion based on the forces that you apply. Okay? And so now let's go through a, a couple different examples. This is our observed plate velocity, that with our plate velocity ratio of 3.5, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so I'm going to do a case with the uniform uh, lithospheric thickness. And I'm going to vary the amount of slab pull along this axis. So on the left side, there would be the slabs are detached from the plates. On the right side, I'm exerting a full slab pull force that I estimate. And then in between, I just multiply that maximum slab pull force by some fraction. And that's the fraction. Okay, so first we'll consider a case with no asthenosphere and uniform thickness plates. And if you do that, you need the entire slab pull force in order to get close to this ratio of subducting plate speeds to non-subducting plate speeds. So you need based on like those slabs to pull about 100%. This is what we found in our 2000 inch paper. Okay, and this is a MIT, we call it a misfit function. It's a, it's a, a statistical measure of the difference, the vector difference between these two. Okay, so you want to minimize this solution. So that's the case with no asthenosphere. And did you say what you meant by asthenosphere? A low viscosity region. So it's all, all I'm talking all about the mechanical. I, I, okay, initially I don't have any asthenosphere. Now I'm going to add an asthenosphere, and it's a factor of 10 times less viscous than the upper man. So basically, I have a, a stiff lithosphere, it grades into a low viscosity region that gets down to uh, the value of, let's say, it's 0.1, then the, then the uh, upper mantle below 300 kilometers is be 1. It's 10 times less viscous. And if you add that, then you don't need as strong slab pull in order to drive your plate motions at the right uh, In order to accelerate these uh, subducting plates, these subducting plates, to the absorbed value. So here and now we're down to, we reach near this 3.5 value at about 50% uh, slab pull. So you can either put shallow roots in or you can have uniform thickness plate. But once you add that asthenosphere, then you don't need a strong slab pull in order to drive plate motion. In order to, to predict the absorbed patterns of plate motion. So I would argue that this solution is just about as good as this solution. And so you can see that our predicted plate motions actually are pretty good in comparison to the user, both in direction and in line. And then we can do another case where we're going to use some different assumptions about the, uh, the cratons and how deep they penetrate. And we're going to allow them to be deep enough that they extend down to the base of the asthenosphere. So there's almost no asthenosphere beneath the cratons, and there's a low viscosity uh, asthenosphere everywhere else. And that's this green curve here. And now we're down to about 20% slab pull that we need. And the reason for that, we're seeing decreasing uh, need for slab pull as you add more coupling between the cratons and the, and the, and the mantle flow is that the uh, presence of those deep cratons and the coupling to mantle flow tends to slow down the continental plates. And so you don't need a large slab pull to speed up the oceanic plates. So you get a pretty good prediction with only 20% slab pull if you have these really deep cratons. So conclusions one, and I'm going to move on in a sec to a different aspect of this, is that um, slabs are only are probably only partially coupled to the plates, but the degree of coupling, kind of where you are on this axis depends on the maximum strength of the slabs and whether or not the, how much slab how much of the slab pull force can support. So but there's a trade-off. If you allow for deeper roots, you can have a weaker slab pull force in order to explain it. So you need slab pull, some slab pull but not the full amount. 
you possibly can have. The basal attractions are very important. You can flip couples to the plates. And you need a, uh, a, a significant a cratonic drag so the continents are slowed by the presence of this deep crate. And one in three, I guess, trade off. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to. Okay, that's where I, at least I think we stand in terms of where the, um, of our understanding of plate motions right now. And a lot of that work, I should mention, was done in the last year by my postdoc, uh, guest reason. Okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, I'm going to argue that we can start moving into the time domain by looking at something that I like to call the net characteristics of plate motion. So, I'd like you to consider the black arrows here, the present day plate motions, present day relative plate motions, and you can calculate in a net sense the point on the earth that all the plate motions are moving towards in a net sense. So you take the, kind of the average of all these vectors and they point, they would pierce the earth, come out of the earth at this point, which happens to be in North Korea, and then there's an offset pole uh, near South America. So, in a sense, all the plates on an average sense are moving towards North Korea. And this is the average, is something like this. Okay. So, how does that compare to the average pull force? So, if we calculate that same slab of pull forces that I showed you earlier, on average, all those pull forces are converging to a point kind of near South Korea in Asia. And uh, let's see. So, and then there's an opposite pull. Okay. And let's consider a third one: the average of all those basal tractions on average converges to a point right there. Okay. So you can argue about how much slab pull or basal tractions, uh, their relative contribution, but both tend to draw the plates towards this North Korean point. So I'd say I'd like to argue that this is more evidence that. Um, that these two forces are really what is ultimately driving driving plate motions. And so just to show these three points on the Earth, the plate motions, the basal tractions, and the slab pull are all co almost co-located. And it didn't need to be that way. Okay, let's talk about a different um, viewpoint which Rob referred to, the quadrupole motion of the plates. And you can consider this, I tried to draw it here. If, um, if you think about the plates are on average moving in a, in a degree two sense, on average moving away from some point, I'll call that the plus point, and they're moving on average towards this minus point, and then there's another one on the other side of the world, and then they're moving, they're doing this about the third pole, which is the zero. So for the present day mantle, sorry, for the present day plate motions, the plus pole is near the specific rise, it's moving towards the Marianas Trench in the minus point. There's another plus point in Africa also moving towards there. And they're both moving, everything's moving away from this minus point also, and they're moving around this here. Okay, so I'm going to call that the plate tectonic quadrupole. Now, out of the quadrupoles for the mantle tractions and slab pull compare, they're also co located, which it didn't need to be that way. So the, the mantle tractions and the slab pull are all in this same pattern of pulling the plates away, of driving the plates away uh, from these plus point from these plus points and towards these minus points. So I'd like to offer this as more evidence that mantle flow is um, is largely it, that this the mantle tractions and slab pull are really dominating. Okay, so just to look at the flow patterns in the mantle that are causing this quadrupole, and the upwelling beneath Africa, sorry, Africa's here, switch to Pacific view, Africa's here, so the upwelling beneath, beneath Africa, and beneath the South Pacific, there's a lot of red stuff in the seismography models, and if you interpret that as rising, then that drives the flow upwelling there, so everything moves away in the surface. Okay, so now let's go back in time and try in 2010, published a new um, a new uh, plate tectonic reconstruction. These are some snapshots for it with kind of random colors for the different plates, just to make them look nice. Um, 
and uh, I'm going to I'm going to apply this the same analysis to past play functions. And the interesting thing is, if we can say that the net characteristics of the surface tectonics is telling us something, is linked to the mantle flow patterns that are associated with the basal attractions, then the net characteristics link play functions to mantle flow. So we can use the net characteristics, this quadrupole and dipole, to, to apply them to tectonic reconstructions and then infer mantle flow patterns from just the surface expression. So we can see how those quadrupoles and dipoles move with the current. Okay, so this is how the, quad, the dipole moved with the current. Okay, so and I'm going to show this. This is red as recent times, and you go back towards 251 years ago, which is the beginning of trying to construction. Then it gets to be more blue. So it starts off here in North Korea, moves around with the Asia, but it never gets too far from this. And then similar with first possible. The net convergence point has remained relatively stable in um, the Western Pacific. So maybe this tells us that this, the dipole component of mantle flow has had a dominant, it just reflects the continued dominance of West Pacific type of Okay. Now I'm going to show the quadrupole has also remained relatively stable through time. You just look, but there's a twist to it. So you look at 0 to 90 billion years, the plus full and relatively stable location, minus full and relatively stable location. I've not shown the zero pole because it makes the plus. So basically, this pattern of moving away from the east, the Middle East Pacific rise, and towards these two points in South America, we go farther back in time, we see that pattern change towards a more north south orientation. Moving still from these same two points in Africa and the Pacific, but towards the, towards the north and the south. And if we go back farther in time, we have kind of an intermediate case, which has still the same locations, Africa and the Pacific, moving towards more, uh, more northwest, south, east. Okay, so that, so the locations of, the locations of these plus, of the, of the upwelling component of the dipole were not relatively stable in the South Pacific and Africa. But the locations of where the downwelling component of that has swung back and forth across the North Pacific and South Pacific. And so from that, we can infer that this picture, which um, Rob showed, actually Rob showed both of these pictures from uh, Chomsky et al. and Dorset et al. And this picture of the quadrupole moment, uh, these structures being relatively stable, meaning South Pacific and Africa, and then belted by subduction around, and then the net motion of the uh, of the downwelling component, and that swings around on the surface of the Earth, North Pacific and North Pacific. And so this image of these structures in the deep mantle being relatively stable is um, at least consistent with the surface expression of uh, plate tectonics in terms of these net characteristics. So that's um, actually where I'm going to stop, and I'll just, uh, just leave this. So thanks a lot.